All right, guys, we've done it. We've made it to the end of Unit 8. I know it seems like it's been going on forever, but we finally made it. Our last topic, guys, is 8.14. We're going to call this Society in Transition. So we're going to cover things like Watergate, um, some important Supreme Court cases, and also some economic problems facing America in the 1970s. So let's get into it. We're going to begin by looking at some really important Supreme Court cases of the 1960s. We'll do important uh, cases from the 70s a little bit later in this uh, topic. All right, well, let's go through the basics. Again, I'm not going to go through every last excruciating detail of these court cases. I'm just going to tell you why they're important. Um, a quick note before we get into them. No, you don't have to remember every single uh, Supreme Court case we've ever talked about. Definitely know the big ones. Okay, you've got to know things like Plessy versus Ferguson, the Dred Scott case, Marbury versus, Marbury versus Madison, uh, Brown versus Board of Education, you know, the big ones. But the more court cases you do know, the more information you'll have to use, say, in your writing, if, if that's appropriate for the topic you'll be presented with on the test. All right, 1963, Gideon v. Wainwright, what this, uh, the precedent set by this court case is that defendants are entitled to legal counsel even if they can't afford said legal counsel. So you've heard of like public defenders. What they do is they are paid by the government to represent people who can't afford a lawyer of their own. That way, in theory, a person doesn't get um, less justice just because they're poor. Because let's be honest, if you're rich, you can hire really good lawyers. Maybe you have a better chance of getting uh, acquitted than a poor person who has to represent themselves, and they don't know the law, and therefore they're more likely to be con get, to get convicted. So and what this court case is about is trying to level the playing field, making sure all Americans, rich and poor, have some sort of legal representation if they are in court. All right, 1965, we're going to look now at something called Griswold versus Connecticut. And what this court case does is it overturns a ban on contraceptives. Now, this is going to be a court case that's going to lead directly to um, the, the famous uh, Roe v. Wade case, which is going to allow uh, um, abortions uh, later. So this is a very important case in that direction. Now, the, the argument here is that um, the government can't ban contraceptives because people have a right to uh, to medical privacy. That the government can't interfere with what you're doing behind closed doors and with your doctor and so forth. So even though the right to privacy is not mentioned anywhere in the Bill of Rights, the Supreme Court justices who ruled in this case uh, said that basically it's implied by other rights. So it's rights based on other rights basically is kind of what they're going with here. All right, 1966, Miranda versus Arizona. So if you've ever watched, and I know you have, you've seen you know, a cop show or a movie or something, the guy's under arrest, the cops always tell them that they have a right to remain silent and that anything they say can be held against them, right? So the reason this, that they have to say that, that Miranda writes, um, they have to say those to you, is because of this court case that um, basically what the court was saying is your ignorance of your civil rights does not mean that those civil rights don't exist. In other words, if you didn't know that you could just not say anything until you have a lawyer present uh, to advise you, the cops could trick you into saying something or admitting something, and then that could be used against you. And uh, what the cops have to tell you up front is, listen, you have a right to not say anything that might... Uh, incriminate yourself until you have a lawyer present while we question you. All right, <coughs> excuse me, now let's get into Watergate now. I'm going to show you a map here of 1972 in the election, and we're going to see how close was this election. Was it a nail-biter? Uh, no, it was an absolute beatdown. Nixon just destroys the, the Democratic nominee, uh, George McGovern. You can see the popular vote 60 to 38. Uh, the Electoral College 97 percent basically. This is about uh, as, as a landslide as you could possibly get. And yet, and yet in that election Nixon was, well as Nixon usually was, paranoid. Nixon was a guy who always feared that there were people out to get him and people looking to take him down. 
And so to to cover all of his bases and make sure he knew everything he could know about the Democrats in this election in 1972 to make sure he has all the advantages to protect himself against any kind of you know tricks the Democrats might be planning, Republicans uh, decide to break into the Watergate Hotel. So this is the Committee for the Re-election of the President, better known as Creep. They're going to break into the Watergate Hotel. Why this hotel? Well, this in the offices of this hotel was uh, a Democratic campaign headquarters, basically. And so the theory was if they could break in and plant bugs there, they could listen to what the Democrats were talking about, and they wouldn't know any better, and then that would give the Republicans an advantage. Again, think about that map we just looked at. This, of course, was totally unnecessary. Uh, Nixon really steps in it for no good reason. He doesn't know he's going to win that landslide, but he will, and so therefore this whole break-in thing was not needed. Worse yet, the people who were breaking in were total amateur criminal, criminals and end up getting caught. And then, of course, once they're caught, everyone starts wondering, well, did the president know about this? Did he order this? Um, you know, what, what, what culpability does the president have for this crime? And suspicion begins to grow. And suspicion grows that even if Nixon had not order it, ordered this break-in personally, that he, he had learned about it, and then he was involved in covering it up. And, of course, covering up a crime is a crime. And so sp suspicion is growing that Nixon is involved in illegal activities. Now, it also turns out that Nixon had the habit of tape recording his conversations. Okay, phone conversations and conversations he had in his offices. So, you know, basically you could find out what he knows if you could get your hands on these tapes. And Congress says, turn them over. We want to listen to these tapes. And Nixon says, no, you can't do that. And his justification was this thing called executive privilege. So executive privilege is not, again, it's not in the Constitution uh, explicitly. What it is is this idea that to maintain separation of powers and a balance of powers that each branch should have some sort of uh, privilege. In other words, some sort of layer of, of insulation or even secrecy, you might call it, uh, among the other branches. There, there are certain things that the, the executive branch should be able to do kind of uh, uh, without the legislative branch, for example, uh, getting involved. We call this executive privilege. And Nixon hides behind this and says, well, no, I'm not going to turn these tapes over. Uh, that will be breaking down the barriers of the separation of powers. And then in October of 1973, uh, the prosecutor who had subpoenaed the tapes, and a subpoena guy is basically just a court order to turn over evidence, the guy who had ordered that is fired on Nixon's orders. Now, to get the prosecutor fired, though, Nixon had to go through several other people. He tells his attorney general to fire the prosecutor. The attorney general resigns instead of firing him. Then the deputy, a deputy attorney general also resigned because he didn't want to fire the prosecutor. And so you have just this, you know, uh, this cleaning of the house by Nixon of firing everybody involved in this case. And this is known as the Saturday Night Massacre. Now, all this does, of course, is raise the temperature and, and convince people that Nixon's up to no good. Because if he wasn't, the theory goes, why is he firing everybody? You know, if you're not if you're not guilty, why are you acting so guilty? Is kind of what people are, are thinking and saying. Finally, on July twenty fourth, nineteen seventy four, the Supreme Court says Nixon, you've got to turn over your tapes. Uh, just you know, you got to do it. You have to turn over the tapes. And Nixon reluctantly uh, is going to comply on this. Now, as the tapes are being turned over, the House of Representatives begins preparing to impeach Nixon on charges of obstruction of justice. And I think, you know, obstruction of justice is uh, certainly, I mean, it fits the crime, right? This, If you're looking at it from not Nixon's perspective, that certainly looks like obstruction of justice. Firing people involved in the case, hiding your tapes. Um, you know, that looks like obstruction of justice. So Nixon finally turns over the tapes, and they certainly make him look very guilty of ordering the cover-up. And Nixon, realizing that the end has come, if he holds on any longer, he will in fact be impeached. And not only will he be impeached, he will be removed from office.
you know, obviously we've had impeachments in American history, uh, four of them, none of them resulted in a, a, a conviction and removal from office. This one almost guaranteed would have, and Nixon, seeing the handwriting on the wall, decides to resign rather than having to suffer through the disgrace of being literally kicked out of the White House. And so there's Nixon leaving the White House for the last time and turning over the reins of power to Vice President Gerald Ford right there. So President Ford comes into office, and he is our only unelected president. And what I mean by that is, even though he was the vice president under Nixon, he had not been elected vice president because Nixon's vice president, a guy named Spiro T. Agnew, had been uh, forced to resign because he was accused of not paying his income taxes. And so Ford had been chosen by Congress to replace Agnew as vice president, and then Ford becomes the replacement for Nixon. So he goes from uh, just a guy in Congress to becoming president in rapid succession, again, never elected by the American people as president, which is uh, kind of an oddity in American history. Now, what Ford does is he issues a, a pardon to Nixon for any crimes he committed as president, okay, any crimes he committed. And you can see the, 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 the readings right here. It's a, a full, free, and absolute pardon unto Richard Nixon for all offenses that have committed or taken part in. Okay, so uh, this is a just a blanket get-out-of-jail-free card. Now, this got a lot of people angry. They're like, why in the world would you let Nixon get away with this stuff? Uh, this certainly looks like a different justice system if you're going to let some rich and powerful politician go scot-free for committing crimes and you wouldn't do that same thing for an average person. So Ford takes a lot of heat. However, in hindsight, many people, you know, with, with time to kind of analyze this and for the, 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 the emotions of the Watergate scandal to kind of wane a little bit and look at this a little bit more rationally, many historians actually believe Ford did the right thing because think about Nixon on trial. Think about Nixon going to jail. It would have been you. All you would have done is prolong this, this, this crisis, this scandal, um, and it wasn't needed. Basically, what Ford says is, for the good of the country, we need to put this behind us. And the quickest way to do that is to just let Nixon go, and that's the way it's going to be. You know, it's it's not it's not to help Nixon out. It's help. It's to help the country out. Is what his argument would have been. All right, let's get into a couple of court cases from the 1970s. Uh, <clears throat> the first one we're going to look at is called Milliken versus Bradley. This is from 1974. So you remember Brown versus Board of Education, of course, in 19 uh, in the 1950s. And what Brown versus Board of Education said is that desegregation of schools had to happen with deli all deliberate speed. In other words, now you know, don't wait around. You got to do this now. But the reality is school districts across the country, especially in the South, but not just in the South, you see this all, all even up in northern cities as well, had been dragging their feet and had not really been desegregating very well. And you still had uh, schools that were overwhelmingly white and overwhelmingly black in the same school district. And so to try to overcome that, many cities had adopted this policy known as busing. And what busing refers to is... Um, let's say you've got a, a, a neighborhood that's overwhelmingly white and an, a, a neighborhood that's overwhelmingly black. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, bus kids from the black neighborhood to the white neighborhood and some kids from the white neighborhood to the black neighborhood to go to the schools to, to mix up the population more. So that meant even if you had a neighborhood school right next door to you, you might have to travel across town to go to another school to try to, achieve, to try to achieve some diversity for these schools. Again, this is called busing. It was very, very controversial. And what this court case said is that busing with any school district is okay, but they, you can't force them to cross school district lines. Now, what, that, for, what does that mean in practice? Well, if white students didn't want to go to school in a black, you know, with black students, what they could do is white parents could move out of that district, say, out to the suburbs or something, and then white kids would still be going to an overwhelmingly white school, and black students would be uh, going to an overwhelmingly black school because they had basically separated along school district lines. 
All right, this brings us to another case involving uh, race. This is known as the Backy case from 1978. And it refers to this guy right here. Um, <coughs> excuse me, his name was his last name was uh, Backy. Alan Backy was his name. And he had applied uh, to, to UC Davis, to the medical school there and University of California. And he was uh, denied. And his... His denial, he believed, was based on the fact that the school of UC Davis had had adopted um, a a plan where uh, certain slots of admission for the school were held uh, held out for non-white candidates. So, in other words, um, we would kind of cap the number of white students be admitted uh, to allow a certain number of black students and other races and so forth. And what Backy said was, well, well, that's that's not fair because if I had the qualifications to get in, but I didn't get in because there weren't enough white slots in the school admission policy, then my civil rights are being violated. This is known as reverse discrimination. And the support, uh, the Supreme Court said um, that you could take race as a factor in a school admission policy, but you can't have racial preference. In other words, you can take a person's race into account when you're saying whether or not they can be admitted to school, but you can't have like a quota system. You can't say, well, we're going to admit exactly 67% white people and 12% uh, black, and you know you can't do it that way, but you can take race into effect. So in other words, it, it's they're trying to have it both ways in many ways, and this is something that is still going on in American politics today. Um, this is called affirmative action, this idea of, of, of trying to um, make it more open to non-white candidates for jobs and education. But again, does that then violate the civil rights of white candidates? That's, that's kind of at the heart of this issue, and this has not really been fully resolved. All right, last topic, guys. Let's quickly look at the economy of the 1970s, uh, and we're going to look at something called stagflation. So stagflation is what we see in the 1970s. So stagnation, of course, is something's not moving, right? So the economy's not growing or shrinking. And what we're seeing in the 1970s is that there, there's there's the economic growth stops, so it's stagnant. But on top of that, you also have the phenomenon of inflation. So if the economy is not growing and inflation is increasing at the same time, this is known as stagflation, and this is a... Uh, really a dangerous economic thing because without economic growth to keep up with inflation what happens is inflation chips away at how much money you're earning so it's basically like a giant pay cut for all americans across the board because prices are going up but your your wages are not going up so what caused stagflation well a couple of things number one foreign competition Remember, when we came out of World War II, guys, our country was untouched by war, but pretty much all the other big countries of the world were digging out from the rubble. And we kind of became uh, a little complacent. You know, we, we didn't see foreign competition coming. Uh, and to compete with Americans, foreigners made better goods, cheaper, more efficient goods. And American consumers started buying foreign goods, and American companies had trouble competing. And this hurts the bottom line. Okay, so Japanese cars, German cars, flooding into America. And then you have the inflation from massive government spending. So this is the reality of, of government spending. When the government starts spending tremendous amounts of money, it causes inflation. And the government was spending tremendous amounts of money, right, on the Vietnam War and the Great Society at the same time. You also had inefficient factories that were outdated in America because, again, we didn't see foreign competition as a thing, and so we had no incentive to improve our factories until it was too late. And so prices are going up, American products are not competitive, American workers are not competitive, and you have a, a perfect storm of economic problems. Add into this the energy crises we were talking about in our last video, right? We've got gas shortages. Oil prices skyrocketing. Every time gas prices go up, it causes all the other prices to go up at the same time. That, again, leads into that inflation. So what are the effects of stagflation? As I keep talking about, guys, prices soar. This hurts the poorest among us the worst. 
And beyond the higher prices, it really was a shocking realization for Americans that perhaps our good times were behind us. We had about a 25-year run after World War II where the economy, with a few exceptions, was booming. And some people really kind of came to the conclusion that was just going to be a permanent thing, that American way of life and our standard of living was going to just go up and up and up and up forever. And then all of a sudden it stops, and there's not a lot of hope that it will get better in the future. And that is a shock to the system, and it causes Americans to lose confidence and to also think that maybe our future is bleak, that maybe we don't really have a future as much as we thought we had. All right, so we left off on a rather bleak note there uh, as we finished up 8.14 and Unit four, uh, 8 all together. Um, and that bleakness we're going to see play into, in fact, of the election of 1980, which we're going to look at uh, in Period 9. So again, that's Period 8, guys. We will start Period 9 in our next video.